And my math shows that we've got 52 people in the room and we are 45 seconds early. <laughs> so for those of you who are old school and used to do the live streams with me on the weekend, uh, I would get the room ready. And I said, I, I'm going to launch at two o'clock or whatever time it is. But of course, if 50 people show up, I'll talk because in my mind, 50 is a, a good group of people, a good crowd of people. So here we are on a Friday. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, I think I might have said I was going to do it two o'clock today. And I told some people one o'clock and I apologize. Uh, it's based largely on my schedule. I can't always guarantee that I'm available uh, weekdays, you know, the old Monday through Friday thing, my nine to five, because I might actually be working. <laughs> What's up with that? But uh, thank you, everybody who's here. We got a whole bunch of people in the house, including Boy Cat from the old school days, Donald uh, Westerdale, Bobby Dahl, Connor Harrison from Bowling Green, Ohio, Hammond from Marin County or Marin County, I guess they call it. Uh, now the feed's going by so fast. PJ from New Mexico, Bradley from Minnesota, NM and MN, QA Library. This is different. Well, kind of, but we did it last week. Clive Weatherly, hi from the UK. Uh, Turninet, uh, Ohio, Iowa, excuse me. Um, Tom S. Milford, Ohio. It's a town called Milford, Michigan, too. Very pleasant town. I've been there many, many times. And of course, Knock Knock, 1975. Love your humor, Steve. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, Dan Busey says, man, you're getting close to half a million subs. And that is absolutely true. And I have to tell you, for those of you who don't know yet, that this Sunday is literally the 10-year anniversary of me starting a channel on YouTube, okay? So I put together a video. It's a long video, but it includes all kinds of stuff. I answer questions that people have had for a long, long time. <laughs> and also a couple special guests pop in really quick. So that's Sunday, this Sunday, the 31st, which I understand is Easter, at noon, that video will go live for the first time and I'll premiere it where I'll have a discussion box like this next to it so we can have a little talk while we watch my new video. So that's this Sunday. Please check it out. I put a ton of work into that video, <laughs> much more than I usually do. Hey, Bob's checking in from Benton Harbor, Michigan. Benton Harbor's over here. If you check in from a town in a state, if you don't, you know, uh, if, if you're not sure I'll know where the town is, be sure to let me know what state you're in. If you're checking in from, I don't know, Europe or a, a country like Finland, please tell me the town you're in. I love those as well. But if you're in Michigan, you got to tell me where you are so I can hold up my hand and say, oh, by the way, you know, Traverse City's up here and Bay City's over here and Benton Harbor is over here because we like doing that here in Michigan. Jason Johnson checking in from Westland. Westland, which I believe if you're talking about Westland, Michigan, is where the Token Lounge is. And I saw the Sweet play there not so long ago. Great show. Not the original suite, but they're endorsed by suite, if you know what I mean. So Neuropilot, hi, Steve Leto. Thank you for checking in, my friend. I appreciate that. And I do like all the people checking in. Lawrence, Michigan. Geraldine Lima. Lawrence, Michigan. That one's not ringing a bell. I apologize. I wish I knew. I don't. I could look it up, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking to other people here. Justin Northrop, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My brother ran an ultra marathon that I believe went from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. It was 100 26 miles. So you run 100 miles and then a full marathon. And at that point, you stumble over the line and they give you, I don't know, it was a belt buckle or a medal or something. They should, they, they ought to give you a medal for running 126 miles. But <laughs> so <laughs> Scott Argyle, happy anniversary, Steve, from the Oregon coast, Seal Rock, Seal Rock. DJ Wilson, Harrison, Michigan. Harrison's kind of in the middle part of the state. Bill, Bill from Nashville, Indiana. And Andreas, checking in from Lulea, Sweden. Thank you for checking in, my friend. I appreciate the people checking in from other countries. Uh, Dirt Bike, Michigan, checking in from Davisburg, Michigan, not Davis Sun, Michigan. Those are near each other. Davisburg's on the other side of 75, and I often drive through it my way back from the Highland House. I'm not driving around in the country. <laughs> so uh, Beverly Fitch, also from Harrison. Okay. Uh, ATN Vell, Montreal, Quebec. Hey, JP, you got some uh, some of your countrymen in the house. JP um, uh, points out that Lawrence, Michigan is 30 miles east of Kalamazoo. Oh, I, I should have known that. There's that whole corridor down there. And I don't spend as much time there as I'd like to, but I should spend more. Kurt G in Grand Blank, Michigan. Grand Blank is the Bloomfield Hills of Flint. 
an inside joke for about three people. Oh, boy. Mein Kampf, hello from your mom's house. <laughs> hey, it's an old school joke, okay? Dan Wett in Genesee County. Genesee County, of course, where Grand Blank is, which we just did a shout out to. David Hoagland checking in from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, by the way, I had some people ask me last week, uh, and Steve, what type of camera were you using? And I said, well, it's a Logitech, uh, but I'm not really sure. I'm looking at it. I don't really see uh, identifying information on it. When I fired it up just now, it told me that it was an HD Pro Webcam C920. <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. I bought it a couple of years ago and I've used it for things like this and it works. Max H is my wife's and my 47th wedding anniversary. Wow. Congratulations, my friends. You guys are doing it right. Uh, you can spend that much time together and you're still happy and you're celebrating it. Like I said, congratulations. They are, they are to be respected. Let's celebrate their first super on a live stream. <laughs> A-I-C-E-O. Thank you very much. Just says keep it up, and I appreciate that. I appreciate any shout out, of course. So MG Mustang 05 says, howdy from Bay City. We need a new theater director. <laughs> I just did one story about that, and it's a weird story because uh, Rick Springfield, among other people, played up there and didn't get paid. And when he started investigating why he wasn't paid, the money had disappeared. And there is somebody chasing around the former director of the theater. And there's allegations that he may be partly behind why the money wasn't there. So we'll just leave it at that. I did get some more stuff sent to me, but they were not uh, specific enough with the allegations for me to do a whole video, but I might do a follow-up on it because I'd like to see Rick Springfield get paid, okay? <laughs> Bill Ream, I met you at the Tucker Show in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, I, great, my friend. It's good seeing you, too. Uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania is the home to two very good auto museums. One of them's got a bunch of Tuckers, and I spoke there along with a group of other people celebrating uh, one of the anniversaries of the Tucker Corporation. Uh, my good friend Mark Lieberman was there. Adam Lukachel was there. Um, and I think I saw either six or eight Tuckers in one place. It was crazy. And um, you've got to check out that museum if you get a chance. And um, it was it was a great occasion. Beautiful weather. They fired these things up on driving them around. And I mean, I, I think I posted it maybe on my Facebook page or someplace. But I actually got video of a couple Tuckers rolling by under their own power. You don't often see that many of them in one place, let alone them driving. So TK Tin Man, people say Steve from Leicester, M-A. Is that Massachusetts? It's Massachusetts, right? This is M-E, Maine. <laughs> I should know better. Jason Hansen. Hello, Steve and everyone from North Minnesota. Minnesota is really not that different from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in terms of its terrain and weather. Abdul Muhammad says, Steve, wonderful content always. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Where's that $100 bill, bro? Um, I can see it. I don't know if you can or not, but it's right. Let's see if I can do this now. It's right here, sticking out of the handle of that sword that's on the ground. Um, but it's 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 there. It's always there. I was always there. Uh, Grubby old patron is guessing you would have got a Batmobile, not a Cobra, but the Cobra is king. Uh, Batmobile would have taken even longer and cost more money. <laughs> Oh, boy. Susan Laughlin checking in from St. Joseph, Michigan. St. Joseph's over here, not too far from Benton Harbor. It's a really, really good barbecue place up there. I think it's called Lark's. Is that Lark's that I'm thinking of? That's fabulous. Small place, but the food is worth the drive. And it doesn't matter where you're coming from. <laughs> a long drive. It's still worth it. Neuropilot, do you recommend young drivers take their cars on the track to see how they handle, especially at speed? It's not a bad idea. I've always suggested that they should go out in a snowy parking lot where there's no other vehicles with somebody who knows what they're doing and actually practice doing circles and avoiding doing donuts unless you want to, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it takes a while to learn what a car can and cannot do. And unfortunately, a lot of people think, well, the car can do 150, so that's not a problem. You don't understand two things. One is 
uh, things happen very differently at that speed. Stuff goes by you so fast and stuff comes into your field of vision so fast. Uh, if you're driving that fast at night, you are playing Russian roulette. So it's a very, very scary concept. Um, Susan Laughlin says, you're right, it's larks, larks. Oh my God, the place, <laughs> it's been a little while since I was there, but just thinking about it now, it's like road trip. <laughs> uh hey handed in flow nice background love seeing the set from another angle yeah thank you um I, I i was toying with the idea about never telling the truth about the backdrop but i i finally did enough people had it figured it out so uh that's that's that so uh ron valley hi steve from northern illinois west from decab you guys don't pronounce the l right the l is like not only silent but also partly invisible or something uh, Shimmy Kokopop, have you heard of the big classic car show in Reno, Nevada? Uh, not specifically. I know there's big car shows everywhere. Um, it's just a question of, you know, where they are, if I've got the time, and if I feel like taking my car there. Ava Melamute, hello from Finland, checking in. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, that looks kind of like, well, I suppose that first name could have been Finnish, but uh matt or what happened to your old set well well this everything in here is from my old set all i did is i just replaced the wall because i decided to move from one building to the other bruce wiley checking in from wisconsin really enjoyed your whistle pig groundhog or woodchuck story and that by the way is a source of endless debate because a woodchuck and a groundhog are roughly the same thing but if you look it up in a dictionary or an encyclopedia it was also known as a whistle pig but if you look it up someplace that has more specific information, it's there's a whole family, a whole group of animals that fall into this group. And I don't know what, I forgot what the subgroup is called, but it's woodchuck, groundhog, ground squirrel, uh, whistle pig, and a couple others are all related. But here in Michigan, we call them interchangeably woodchucks or, or groundhogs. And of course, the groundhog and groundhog day is what we're picturing here. So the thing that was in my garage was an immature woodchuck. So it was smaller. It was not a baby, but I suspect it was from last year's crop. So he was young. He was young. And so uh, I'll forgive him for his indiscretion. Richard Tracy, why are you doing ads? You mean where I, where I we have a sponsor who pays me to talk about their product? Um, because they pay me to talk about their product. <laughs> St. Ignace Car Show or Truck Show is nice. I've been there many times. It's one of the coolest car shows there is because there is um, a destination. It's at the north end of the Mackinac Bridge. Just hang a right. It's right there. So it's a great place to drive to take your car to. But then it's a beautiful setting. They, they block up downtown St. Ignace. And there's just cars. And you walk up and down. It's always fun to walk up and down a closed street, you know. So I've been there a bunch of times. In fact, one time I got to go there, there was a um, a guy with a helicopter giving rides right out of the parking lot, 20 bucks a ride. And I said, dude, let's go. Flipped him a 20. I had a big old camera with a lens like this long on it. He goes, oh, you want to take pictures? I said, yes. He turned the helicopter sideways and flew it like that so I could get better pictures. And all I could think is don't drop your camera, you'll kill somebody. <laughs> Shrek, do you recommend the legal profession to young people? Um, yes, but you have to understand it's a long slog to get to the traditional way because you have to go to undergrad and law school. And so it's basically a, a master's degree equivalent and it's a lot of work, you know, and, and it's, you know, but, but I know there's alternate ways to do it now in a couple of different states. So that happens. I'm not sure, but it's something that you want to study first. Don't get into it. I've had people say, Steve, I like to argue. People say I should be an attorney. No, it's... <laughs> Don't become an attorney if you like to argue, okay? Become an attorney because you like to uh, speak up for people who can't speak on their own. Uh, speak, uh, Become a lawyer because you want to help people. Uh, become a lawyer because you want to see people get, you know, what they've got coming to them, uh, both whether they're entitled to it uh, or they deserve it, you know, that kind of thing. So um built on the rock homestead points thank uh, points us out thank you for putting the sponsor at the end of the video instead of the middle of the video like most channels do and that is something that i talked about and i said very very early on that i don't like ads especially like the ads that you know come in, I, i'm watching a video by somebody i like and i'm this is a good video 
And all of a sudden they launch into like a three minute long dissertation on some product they're selling. And sometimes you can skip them, sometimes you can't. And those have always bothered me. And I worked in radio and I know what ads do to the flow of a program. And so when some advertisers have approached me, I've always told them, I said, look, guys, the one thing that I'm firm on, but I, I don't think it'll hurt you, is that I put the ads at the end of the video. And if people are interested, they'll watch. If they're not interested, they won't watch, but do it and watch what happens. And the advertisers have all come back and said, there's something about your audience. Um, <laughs> they respond to these ads that you put at the end of the videos. <laughs> so there you go. David A. Palomars. I apologize. I'm, I know I'm butchering that. What classic car would you like to use as your daily driver? I'm assuming you don't mean that I have to use it on like a snowy day or something. And just a, if, I, if I had a daily driver that I could just jump in and drive around. Um... That's a tough call. I, I mean, I like my Viper. I just don't use it as a daily driver because I want to keep the miles down on it. I like the way it looks when it's clean. So I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's That's a tough one. Um, every car I've ever owned was fun to drive under the right circumstances. You know, like I've got two Ford Explorers. I'd rather drive the Viper or the Cobra in traffic all day long. But if I'm in one of my Explorers and I'm up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and I see a dirt logging road, I just, oh, I'll go down this dirt logging road. And two years ago, I was out at the point of the Kuwana Peninsula in, a, in an Explorer that you couldn't have airdropped my Viper in there. <laughs> it just wouldn't have gone in. Oh, believe in yourself is after my experience defending myself in a divorce by getting it dismissed remotely due to improper service. It did feel empowering. I wrote about this for Jalopnik years ago because I actually went to small claims court and sued a transmission shop right before I went to school to become a lawyer. And I found that experience so enlightening and so annoying, except that I won, which made it all worthwhile, that I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And it was it was a lot of fun, but it was a pain. Uh, JP says, let's drive a Jeep Wrangler at the Strip and a Viper in the snow. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that guy recently who took a Viper and put a big old like SUV thing on. No, no, he, he he took the Viper body and put it on a lifted SUV chassis. I don't know why you would do that, but I guess that's, you know, on YouTube, people do stuff that you don't know why they're doing it. But what are you going to do? Grocer Mike says, greetings, my fellow Michigan brother. I appreciate that, especially because you avoided saying Michigander. <laughs> so many people. I want to say, Mein Kampf, Viper, 10 cylinders of love. Yeah. And don't forget, those cylinders are huge. They're 48.8 cubic inches each. <laughs> Matt Jones, hi, Steve from Minnesota, wishing the viewers a great weekend. Dirt Bike Michigan, have you ever been out to Rocket Launch Range at the QA point of the QA Peninsula? Yes, I have. And a Dirt Bike actually worded it better than that. I stumbled over it and screwed it all up. But if you go to the very, very, so so somebody asked earlier too, by the way, how the two peninsulas work. This is the lower, okay? And this is the upper. And so up at the top of the upper is another peninsula called the Kuwana Peninsula. And near the top of that is a town called Copper Harbor, which is absolutely gorgeous. It's probably my favorite place on earth. I love that town. And um, But if you keep driving, the road ends and it becomes a dirt road. Then it becomes like a trail. And it's, it's rough. It is not recommended for average road cars to go down, okay? And so you go out there, and there's a couple of different trails. you got to know which one to take. But you can take your vehicle down this washboardy road. I did it with a, a Jeep Wrangler. And you get to the end of it, and there's a, a concrete slab, and there's a metal half ring, I believe. And then there's a historic marker that's been unfortunately vandalized. But it says this is the QA rocket launch site. And back in the 50s or 60s, they did experiments launching rockets off that peninsula out in out of Lake Superior. And they would they would then uh, uh, retrieve them and uh, did a bunch of research that way. But the site is still there in its mark, but it's very hard to get to. JP Dalton 99 says, Love your Nava timer. I'm a collector of watches. Uh, Breitling is my favorite brand. Thank you. It's kind of funny. A couple of nights ago, a friend of mine, Tom, sent me a note and said, Steve, they're discussing you on a discussion board. And I go, oh, God, no. What, what are they discussing? 
and he says, uh, discussing what brand watch you wear. And I go, no. And it turns out there's a website that is dedicated to guys who like watches. And there's a discussion board. And somebody posted a photograph of me doing this, but the watch was just turned a little bit like that. And they go, does anybody watch Steve Lay? Do you know what brand watch that is? And that's a Breitling Navitimer. It's pretty obvious to people who know watches um, because it's the same watch that, like, say, Jerry Seinfeld wears. Uh, John Taffer on Bar Rescue wears one. And um, also Gordon Ramsay wears a Breitling, but it's a different kind. But you can almost always spot the Navitimer because it's got the three dials either like that or turned one quarter. Um, but I, I've always liked Breitling watches and your little works of art. Brandon C., do you have any pets? No, I do not. Um, I used to have two Shetland Sheepdogs, Milo and Wolfie, who are in the credits of every video, but um, uh, they passed away. Uh, Wolfie uh, made it to 2017. So I decided not to uh, get any dogs for a while now. TK Tin Mints is copper. Now you're talking my lingo. Well, are you, are you tin or are you copper? <laughs> Josh Glover, have you heard anything about the group trying to build a new rocket launch site in Michigan? Uh, I'm not sure. Every now and then people float these ideas. And I, I seem to recall something about that. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I specifically have heard anything about it. I wouldn't want it in my backyard, that's for sure. Because when those things go sideways, <laughs> things get ugly real fast. Whistling Hope, I'm looking to buy a car. I'm in Michigan. I'd like to know some tips and things to watch out for. Number one, understand that 99% of all used cars sold in Michigan are sold as is, which literally means you're buying it as it sits right there. So when the salesman's talking to you, put your fingers in your ear and go, la, 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 because nothing they say to you means anything. Literally, it's meaningless. Uh, and if you don't believe me, read the purchase agreement where it says nothing said by a salesman is binding unless written on this document and signed by somebody else. And so if you ask him to write anything, on the document, he's gonna go, I can't do that. Then why are you talking? So uh, yes, I've had that conversation with salespeople before. I mean, <laughs> I've done it myself, but I've also gone shopping with friends of mine. And I've actually uh, went shopping just a couple of years ago, a friend of mine. And this is a woman I'm shopping with. And the salesman is saying all kinds of things to her. Then you look at me and he realized, like, I'm just looking at him like, dude, come on. And he would, I, I think he was dialing it down just a little bit because I was there. But um, when we sat down to start putting stuff on paper, it was just funny because occasionally I would just pull the old emergency brake. Like, eh, no, skip that. Eh, no, skip that. And uh, But the key is they're all sold as is. Uh, get them inspected. And if, if you can inspect it yourself, that's great. But make sure you take it for an actual reasonable test drive. Don't just walk around or drive around the parking lot, you know. And, and, but ideally get someone who knows cars to look at it if you don't know enough about cars. So I'm letting you know right now that the last vehicles I bought, I literally was laying on the ground underneath them with a flashlight looking at them. And I, I very rarely, when I ask people, I said, well, did you get underneath it? They go, what? Why do you get underneath the car? Because that's where they leak. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Say, ah, says, congrats on your 10th anniversary. Would you like to see in and out Burgers expand to Michigan? Yes. Yes. Get them to as soon as you can. <laughs> I love in and out Burger. But right now, they're still way, way out west. And I wish they were closer. I wish they were closer. Ghost Shadow, hello. Um, Kyle Adams, thank you for showing up with great content every day. I appreciate that. I really do. And I know I say this all the time. But I got to tell you that um, you get so much negative feedback when you're on YouTube that when you get positive feedback, it's like, yes, thank you very much. That offsets it all. Um, I couldn't, Bill says, are you telling us you can fit under a Cobra? No, I can't fit under there, but I can lay on the ground and look underneath it, which is the best I could do. Uh, but my Ford Explorers, for instance, I've gotten underneath them. Uh, my deuce and a half, somebody mentioned earlier, I had an M35 M35 2A, deuce and a half. Uh, it was 1969 AM General. You could not only climb underneath that thing and work on it, you had to reach up to actually work on it because there's literally like, I don't know, two, three feet of ground clearance. It's insane. So 
Uh, Chitlit Law says, hey, Steve, I live in Dallas, but work in Detroit right now. That's interesting. That's interesting. Toe T. Wooker, salt damage the undercarriage. Yeah, that's something you'll spot down there real fast in Michigan. <laughs> oh, 90 knots. 90 knots is an old school friend of the live streams. Hello, caught a live stream. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Wild Bill 57, Johnny Knoxville, you out there. Just like the old days. You know, I forgot to send him a note. I just had too much stuff going on this week. Sheets is coming to Michigan. That's a score. Yeah, I don't know as much about them, but I just know I think they're mainly a southern thing. It's like it's like Waffle House. Is 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 Waffle House where you get in a fist fight in the parking lot at one o'clock in the morning in Georgia? Is that Waffle House? I've never been in one, but I know they're down south. They don't have them in Michigan yet. Um Ghost Shadow says Steve had fun looking at a car at an Anchorage Chrysler Dodge dealership, and the salesperson said that Dodge is supposed to drip oil out of the exhaust until the engine warms up. <laughs> oil? Oil? Because, you know, many vehicles will uh, drip um, fluid, you know, condensation. If the exhaust is cold, pipe is cold, and especially if it's set for a couple of days, and then you warm it up. But that ain't going to be engine oil. Yeah. The geek ass. Yes, Waffle House is fun. Ron Valley, YouTube taught me how to never hire a bad mechanic. Uh, Joe Palu, I found the movie Ford versus Ferrari entertaining. What did you think? I liked it. I watched it. I liked it. Um, however, I just recently watched the other Ferrari movie with Adam Driver. And literally, I'm halfway through it going, this is the movie people are talking about? I just didn't get it. I just didn't get it. So, um, yeah, some of the driving scenes were cool, but it just it didn't do it for me. But I liked Ford versus Ferrari a lot. Old Jar has all my Dodges have done that. Oh, is it drip oil out the tailpipe? <laughs> oh. Royal Roy R L says, is the best way to send you news at a certain email? Uh, no. The best way to send is Steve at Latoslaw.com. Steve at latoslaw.com, um, which is the email. It's like on my website. So you should go there. Um, Lupe Carbajal says, what made you get the Cobra from Backdraft versus Shelby American? Uh, I believe that Shelby Americans are more expensive, but Backdraft um, is a company that my friend Mark Lieberman uh, on the set behind me is a, um, a nostalgic motoring license plate. And my friend Mark Lieberman is the same guy who found me my Viper. And he is an authorized licensed dealer for Cobras from Backdraft. And so I went and talked to him and we ordered one and I got to pick it all out. And I'm extremely happy with it. Have not gotten a chance to drive it lately because below 60 degrees, it is really, really difficult to enjoy. Tim Nossum, did you or your brothers ever ride in your neighbor's rare Ferrari? Uh, the guy across the street from me growing up in Birmingham, Michigan, in a 1962 Ferrari GTO. My brother Ken got a ride in it. I never did. I didn't know it was special. I just knew that Fred had a, had a red uh, Ferrari. That's all I knew. And my brothers are going, but Steve, it's got a, a, a 12-cylinder engine. And I'm like, oh, really? And I didn't know that much about it. And then later on, I was like, wait, that thing just sold for, what, $52 million? That actual car sold for over $50 million. And I'm like, I could have probably had a ride in it. I just never asked. And so I was talking to my brother. And my brother goes, oh, yeah, I had a ride in it. I go, what? And he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, one day I was out there. And, and he routinely bring it out, wash it and wax it, and push it back in the garage. But he'd also sometimes push it out, drive it around a little bit, and then wash it, wax it, and put it back in the garage. And I guess my brother was out there one day and walked over. My brother was an auto, he still is an automotive engineer, although he's retired now. He was talking to the guy who owned the car. And he goes, oh, you want to go for a ride in it? And so Ken goes, yeah, jumped in the car. Uh, and he, and he, my brother actually remembers the actual route they took. He goes, we went down to the end of Yosemite, turned right at Adams, went up to um, uh, Big Beaver Road, hung a left, went up Kensington Road to Charing Crossroad, Charing Crossroad to Woodward, went up to Woodward. He goes, we did one loop and got right back into Charing Crossroad. And he goes, I don't like driving in traffic. <laughs> Tigerman99515, any metal detecting in your future? Um, yes, I keep my metal detector in my truck in the summertime. Um, it's not 
yet warm enough here to detect unless there's a construction scrape or something going on. But I do have a, a White's DFX, uh, and I've also got a White's V3i metal detector. And sadly, White's went out of business during COVID. And it was partially because of COVID, and it was partially because their uh, equipment, their products were being ripped off by companies in China. They were literally making exact knockoffs, including all the logos and brand names and everything. And they said that somebody would turn the detector and go, hey, this thing's defective, uh, fix it. And they go, we didn't make that. And like, your name's on it. I bought that from a guy. And it's like, um, yeah, it's not how that works. So unfortunately, uh, market pressures, I guess you'd call that, made it to where they couldn't. And so White's metal detectors were founded by Ken White back in the 60s, I think. And they were the longest running, best known American company. I know there's others out there like Fisher and so on, but it was so sad. And I remember getting the note saying, hey, we're going out of business. I'm like, what? White's Electronics can't go out of business. Jim Steele, let me get a shout out. Well, there you go, my friend. That's a shout out right there. <laughs> well, Bill 50 says, by the way, coming through five by five. Somebody else said that there might have been an issue with the exact lineup of the audio and the video. That is not something I can control in any way, shape, or form. I apologize. Pretty Butterfly, have you heard about a new copper mine being approved for the Upper Peninsula? Yes, over by the Porcupine Mountain State Park. I'm a little worried about it because it's really, really close to the border with that park. And copper mining is not the cleanest business. Don't get me wrong. We need copper. And if they can extract it without harming anything, knock themselves out. But um, occasionally the mines have not been the best stewards of the land up there. So I'm a little concerned. So let's just say I'm concerned. I'm in favor of it in terms of they say they can do it. But uh, we'll see. Fast Eddie 333, are you going to get a GT40? No, I'm not. But but my uh, dear friend Mark Lieberman of Nostalgic Motors has got one. And uh, I got to talk to him one of these days about it. Because to get a GT40, you had to actually fill out an application and explain to them why you deserve a GT40. And then they actually said, do you um, have a video you can post explaining why you'd be a good person to have a GT40? And so Mark called me up and said, Steve, can you help me shoot this video? So I actually went to his place and I shot it and I edited it for him. It's him on camera talking, but I did all the shooting and editing and stuff. And he called me back later and goes, Steve, boom, I got approved. <laughs> so. Of all the editing work I've done as a video editor, uh, that video is one of the most successful I've ever had because it helped a guy get himself a GT40, which is not an easy task these days. Uh, Velasa Rapture. Hi, Steve Leto. Thanks for all you do. Hopefully those marmots aren't overrunning your property. And also, wasn't the marmot a name of a car back in the old days? Am I off on that or was it a marmot? Um, yeah, Fast Eddie 333 says, I thought Ferrari is the only one that made you do a video. No, no, no. Ford made him do videos for the GT40. They could sell GT40s all day long, uh, despite how expensive they are. And so they just go, hey, look, we instead of just putting people on a waiting list and 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 people bribing us and stuff, which you know they can't, they don't want the dealers involved in this nonsense. So they just said, look, send us an application, send us a video, and then we'll pick. So I'm not quite sure um, what it was about the video, but we'll see. David M., a Douglas Houghton canoe trip part two is ever going to happen. <laughs> oh, God, that's a blast from the past. Back in 2018, I was going to do a canoe trip, and that was the year, if, if, if that's the correct year, whatever year I was planning on doing a canoe trip was the uh, year that they had the massive storm up in the UP and it just destroyed boating conditions on Lake Superior. I have since taken my canoe out on Lake Huron and also down the Titabawassee River. And I might do some more of that one of these days because I got some better cameras and so on. I'm probably not going to go out and try to do anything lengthy on Lake Superior though, simply because of the time involved. And I really need a, like a support staff on that. And it's like, you know something, I don't know. Earthbound Misfit says they are a GT, not a GT40. Huh. Okay. Um, G Keyman565 says, hello from the thumb. And I forgot, where are you in the thumb? So obviously I worked in Bad Axe for years, and that's the, the, the heart of the thumb. <laughs> Q 
Katie the Dev says, any plans in a crazy town epilogue? Um, well, I do explain in the, and I'll tell you right now, it's a great opportunity for the plug. This Sunday is my 10th anniversary of the first video I ever put up on YouTube. So I shot a special 10th anniversary video. It goes live at noon on Sunday. And in it, along with everything else, I answer the question, what happened? What happened to the epilogue and why I did not do an epilogue? And what was the final wrap up on that case that led to the Crazy Town series? So that will be on Sunday at noon. Velociraptor says, I've been listening since Pizza Car Gate. Man, that was a long time ago. That was, that was 2018. The reason I know that is I've recently corresponded with Sam Crack, who is the guy who bought the wrecked pizza car. And then uh, Domino's uh, complains that, hey, dude, you can't be driving around a car with our logo on it. And of course, people are saying, yeah, but he bought it at an auction and that's on there. And so uh, they went back and forth and he made a bunch of videos. I made a video and I actually made a video with him at the time. So Helium says, Steve, the man, the myth, the legend, disregard the negative comments. I try. <laughs> Betty Boop, I hope you get to 500,000 subs. I'm close. I think right now, um, I'll give you the exact number. As of right now, got to go to this page here, 491,652 subscribers. And by the way, yesterday was the highest trafficked day on my channel ever. I had over 700,000 downloads in one day yesterday. Roy R. L. says, how do you handle when you 100% know you're right, but a court rules against you on a motion or a case? It's the main reason I didn't enter law and find losing something with arguments on both sides. Uh, it's happened to me. You take it up on appeal. And I've had all of them overturned on appeal except for one and one of the things that sticks in my craw the most is I had a case where I'm convinced I got not hometown because it was in my hometown, but I think the uh, other attorney uh, had an in with the judge and a judge made an insane ruling. And then on appeal, the court of appeals got confused. and was kind of like, eh, just get this out of here. And I could write an entire book about it, which I might do one of these days, uh, because it's the kind of case that makes you sorry you're an attorney. Because my client that I was representing is the one who got robbed. And I'd get in the hallway. And if he hadn't been in court, I don't think he would have believed me. And I'm like, you saw what the judge just did, right? And he's like, yes, what's going on? And I'm like, take it up on appeal, see what you can do. So it's difficult. And that is actually a, an ethical dilemma. Um, because, you know, it's one thing to go to court and, and there's arguments for both sides. So you argue one side, they argue the other side. It's also annoying when people come in and argue something that's not ethically supportable. And I've seen people make arguments that are so far beyond the pale of ethics. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people get in court and say, Your Honor, the controlling case law in this case is they'll name a case that's not controlling case law. You might go, oh, that's no big deal. No, it is. You're not allowed to mislead a court on things like that. So don't get me going. Um, boob, sweat. Leads to something. I can't read the rest. <laughs> First time joining live. Love your content. I wish the Ford transmission lawsuit was before I traded mine in back in 2016. Yeah, I'd be glad you got out, man. Um, yeah, that, that whole dual clutch transmission thing was a nightmare. They put so many defective cars on the road that um, it's a shame that nothing more happened to them. And they knew about it. They knew about it long before they did anything. Because they knew that the longer they waited, the more those cars would fall off, drop off uh, out of warranty, uh, get wrecked in accidents, and so on. And it got to the point where, you know, uh, they, they had to do something. And there's a couple of class actions that I believe are still, are still uh, lingering out there. Uh, old Jarhead said, I always wish judges were better lawyers. Yeah, there's a whole weird thing with the fact that in Michigan, judges are elected. And most people don't know how to pick a good judge. And, and it's it's only the attorneys in the area know whether or not a lawyer would make a good judge. And only attorneys in the area would know if that judge is a good judge. And instead, they run on things like, I'm tough on crime. Well, does that mean you put innocent people in jail? Or does that mean you punish people who deserve it? Because most judges would actually punish people who deserve it, don't they? 
Does anybody ever actually run on I'm I'm not tough on crime? <laughs> oh boy, Dirk Romswenkel, do you have any collector hobbies? Books, watches, pens, art, not wine or cigars. No, you're correct. Uh, yeah, I don't really collect a whole lot of things. I do have a collection of dictionaries, but I'm not sure how many that is. Um, but uh, and I've got coins, but those are coins I found with my metal detector. So you got to find them first, then collect them. Michael Wallace is my attorney. Always told me the judge is the worst lawyer in the room, so you want to stay out of there. That's not bad. That's not bad because that often is the case. Uh, Marky, I like your WABX sticker. I remember it well. Do you remember WKNR? Keener 13, of course, also known as Keener Radio. Were you around when the drinking age was 18? I was around, but I wasn't 18 yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, Keener 13 was one of the big uh, Detroit top 40 AM stations com competing with CKLW, the big eight out of Canada. Jay says, why do some attorneys defend people such as school shooters and other horrible people even when they're openly guilty. And now I purposely paused this uh, chat here so I wouldn't miss that question because you understand it is not my job to get you off of anything you're charged with as your attorney. My job is to make sure you get a fair trial and the best defense you can. You have to understand that the rules of ethics specifically state that a defense attorney is well within his rights to force the prosecution to jump through every single hoop to prosecute and convict their client. Prosecutor can't do that. That's on them. Okay. And so it would be difficult. And I would have a hard time defending somebody who was obviously guilty of a heinous crime. So let's suppose someone came to me today and said, Steve, we'll give you $10 million. Defend this guy who's, con you know, accused of all these heinous crimes going to go down to history as being just a horrible, horrible person. I, I'd be tempted to go, no, I, I, I don't, I can't, I can't. However, uh, if somebody comes to me and says, Steve, I'm, I'm accused of a crime. Will you defend me? Um, I don't do it anymore, but I used to. I, I, I defended a lot of people in drunk driving cases, but my argument, because it turns out that the best argument was not, you got the wrong guy or he wasn't drinking. It's can we do something to lessen what's going to happen to this person as you go through the system? And that's often the job of the defense attorney. So Phoenix H, congrats on 10 years. I've only been watching for five. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Grubby old Patriot says, I see Nissan has a dual clutch transmission now. Them words turn me away when I see them. Uh, you know, there's other companies that have them also. And and I, you know, it's it's I I, I assume. It was a design issue with the Ford and how they jammed so much stuff in that place. But I, I don't know enough about transmission design and I never really got into that. I handle a lot of those cases and I'm familiar with it. I've done a bunch of videos about the transmissions. And I think that the dual clutch transmission, along with the ignition switch and the GM products, those two things are such shameful chapters in uh, American automotive history that it's it's scary. I, I, I don't think car companies uh, should be allowed to be involved in a situation where people actually died with the ignition detent switch. If you don't know about that, just look it up. And GM took the position that, well, we're still saving money. So, you know. <laughs> K Tanner 11 has been watching since the beginning. Are you talking about before even post Galato's law? Because technically the first couple videos I put up on the channel were not law videos. I put up a video about the Chrysler turbine car, and I put up a video about the Italian hull disaster. Those are the two first, I believe the first two videos I put up. And then shortly thereafter, I put up a Leto's Law video. So four nine four five three says, did you ever imagine Steve and the computer lady would continue for a decade and counting? Uh, no, never did. But the uh, Canadian robot lady to whom you refer, <laughs> a very dear friend of mine, I chatted with her earlier today. She uh, she cut some special intros and outros for my 10th anniversary video, which is going up on Sunday at noon. Um, Fester FM says, used to watch Legal Legal, but stayed away from his videos starting when he got political. K 
can you be a lawyer without dealing with politics? Uh, I try. I try. And the reason I try is that um, I'm familiar with Legal Eagle. He's got a very, very popular channel, uh, but he does a lot of politics in his channel. And, and don't get me wrong, he can do that. I chose a long time ago to try to avoid politics uh, just because I don't think it's 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 not necessary, number one. And also, um, I don't think it's going to change anybody's mind. So why bother? Kay Tanner says Turbin Car, uh, T-U-R-B-I-N. And again, for those of you who, who are upset by my use of the word turban when I say turban car, uh, understand that the word has two pronunciations. I did an entire video on this. And in the videos and the movies that Chrysler made back in 1964, uh, they called them turbine cars. They did not say turbine cars. And if people go, well, Steve, it's obviously I-N-E, so it's Ein, just like turbine engine. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> people don't understand homonyms or alternate pronunciations. Michael Wallace, how long does an episode take to film and edit? Depends on the video and how many mistakes I make. <laughs> Here's some inside information. If you're watching a video of me and all of a sudden you see a, a cut where the image goes blurry for a split second and then all of a sudden it's gone, that's an edit. And what will happen is I'll be talking and I'll say a mistake and I'll go, oh, I'll be talking and then I'll say the correct thing. And you can go back and chop out that say a mistake part and slide the two together and put the fade in there. And it's gone. It's gone. So if you weren't watching the video, you would never see the mistakes. But the mistakes are all present with the ghostly apparition of the crossfade there. So <laughs> species 1571, can we see the view out your window? Um, I'd have to turn some stuff around and I'm scared to do that because once I do that, I couldn't remount it. So um, Mark Miller. Do you swear when you make a mistake? <laughs> That's a funnier question than you think it is. About five years ago, six years ago, I used to actually shoot the video and record the audio on two different devices. And so I would, I would edit the video and upload it. And then I had to edit the audio. And once or twice, I screwed up and forgot that I had edited something out in a video that was left in the audio. And one day I was having a bad day and I shot a video and I did it several times where I, I made a mistake. And at one point I go, ah, and I said the big long word that starts with mother and ends with earth. <laughs> it has a four letter word in the middle. But I'm in the privacy of my studio with the doors closed. Nobody heard it, but I recorded it. So I upload the video, which is correct. It does not have that in there. And I upload the audio where I left it in there. And it was it was within one minute of the start of the video. Welcome to Leto's Law. Here's Steve Leto, blah, 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 blah. And I swore, and I kept going. And I think, I think it was Mark, a guy named Mark in California who very quickly sent me a note, an email. And he said, it's an urgent, 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 urgent. And he goes, I think you missed an edit at the one minute, 37 second mark of your audio only podcast. And I'm like, I immediately realized what it was. And I ran to my computer and I deleted it. And it had only been heard like 13 times. And he was the only person who reached out to me. He's the only person who, 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 who reacted. So I don't know if the other people heard it or not, or they didn't care. But um, obviously, if I've been on the radio, that would have been very, very ugly from the FCC viewpoint. But I'm not on the radio, so it doesn't matter. Kenneth Darkwater says, love your show, Steve. Forget Fox and CNN. You're my favorite source for what is really important in the news. Thank you for all you do. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I have to tell you, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, just yesterday, Brian. And uh, he goes, Steve, he goes, I talk to a lot of people who say they get their news off of YouTube. And I said, you know something? I watch YouTube more than I watch any other channel on the TV, on the cable, uh, on any of that stuff. And, and now it's true, if, if, if I want to do a deep dive into something, I'll look something up and I'll go find a story here or a story there and I'll look at diagrams and stuff. But when it comes to you know news of the stuff I like to follow, 
there's a few websites I follow and a few YouTube channels I follow, and there you go. So, um, Velociraptor says, I drive past an RV park on my way to the office every day, and I always think, suckers. <laughs> you know, I always try to tell people, there's nothing wrong with buying an RV as long as you know what you're getting yourself into. And I've had so many people who buy an RV, then they go on the internet, they find my video and they call me and go, hey, I bought an RV, can you help me? And I'm like, I'm curious, why are you calling me? Well, you did the video called Don't Buy an RV. And I go, uh, okay, let me guess. You bought the RV first, then you watched the video, right? You didn't, you didn't. <laughs> it's what we call an order of operations program, a uh, problem, okay? That's the problem. You should have done it the other way. So I apologize. Uh, Joe B, have you ever gotten a client from your YouTube channel? Congrats on 10 years. Love your stories. Uh, I've had quite a few people tell me that they saw me on YouTube, but the problem, of course, is I can only handle cases in Michigan and I only handle lemon law claims. So I've had a couple of people call me and say, Steve, uh, I got a lemon law. I'm in Michigan. It finally happened to me. But if you think about it, the odds of those two things intersecting is very, very rare. But um, it's obviously good advertising. I know it helps my search engine optimization. <laughs> So a lot of people who search for lemon laws in Michigan find me uh, and uh, they might not be viewers of the show, but you know, what are you going to do? Uh, Nightwalker, buying an RV is like buying a boat. Yeah, there's all kinds of jokes about buying boats or buying RVs. Uh, it's kind of like they say um, the two happiest days of those uh, people who buy those things is the day they bought it, number one, the day they got rid of it, number two. Um, and that's it. And so I've jokingly told people that I had uh, relatives who had boats and jet skis and all that stuff. And every summer I'd go visit and get it out of my system. <laughs> and my friend would say, Steve, aren't you tempted to buy one now? And I'm like, no, I got it out of my system. <laughs> Let someone else deal with it. Loki Va says, Mar Mariner's Dictionary, a boat is a hole in the ocean into which one throws money. That's another one. That's another one. So... G Keyman says, if you're going to do a live, do it in a good chair. Well, I'm doing it in a good chair today. And I'm sure you're commenting on the fact that I do, in fact, have a folding chair back there. And people do ask why I do my videos on a folding chair. It doesn't move. It just sits there, which is what I'm doing. And I don't want to be moving or doing this stuff or rocking. And also, I'm not sitting there for very long. So I sit down, do the video and get up. But it was really important for me to be stationary. I didn't want to be moving at all. So having a chair that stays there is extremely important. Uh, Nightwalker, top of the line folding chair. <laughs> I don't know about that. I got six more just like it. Jeanette Waverly says hello, and I appreciate that, my friend. Uh, there is a, an icon there. I'm guessing it's an icon of some sort or a, an emoji. It appears to be an emotion. So Ghost Shadow says if you buy an RV, you need to be really aware of what required upkeep is. Only time I had a problem with an RV was brand new Thor Axis, total garbage, seven pages of defects, including a crooked frame. Well, required upkeep is one thing, but also understand that they're going to take a lot of work and they're not designed to be lived in year round. So I think people tell me their fantasy was to retire and buy an RV and travel the country. I say, okay. And then they buy an $85,000 RV, which goes down the road doing this because it's made out of like shaky two by fours. And I'm like, that's not going to last. And then they get someplace and they're like, all the cupboards are out of square. Doors fell off. The mirror fell off the wall. The plumbing doesn't work. You know, like, what did you think you were going to get for $85,000 or whatever it was? And I've had someone from a manufacturer at a deposition actually tell one of my clients, what did you think you're going to get for that money? So you don't expect this thing. And they're like, no, they're not designed to be lived in year round. Now, if you got an RV, you use it two weeks out of the year, which by the way, is what the average person does. You get an RV, you use it two weeks out of the year, and you anticipate that when you use it, stuff's going to go wrong. Eh, well, deal with it. And you're fine. And if you're a handy person, I tell people, go out and buy a used one. Buy a used one. Someone else took a gigantic hit in the depreciation. So Jeffrey, 3005, all hail the folding chair. <laughs> Steven Anderson, what's the story about watch out for low-flying owls? Um, I should really do like entire videos answering questions like that. Um, 
years ago, I was driving down in Florida in the Keys, and I saw a sign that said, beware of low-flying owls, which I thought was the funniest thing ever, so I took a photograph of it. Then, years later, I did a story on somebody flying an airplane that came in and hit a car. And I wanted to use uh, beware of low-flying airplanes, and, and I remembered I had that photograph. So I used that photograph as the image because I thought it was funny. And then somebody sent me the sign, and I've had it on the, on the wall ever since. So it came up as a joke about a thumbnail I used for a video about a low-flying airplane, but it was based on an actual sign I did see and I took a photograph of. And by the way, I actually had somebody go, uh, low-flying owls, this guy must be from Michigan. It's like, dude, the only one I've actually seen in real life was in Florida. What do you mean Michigan? Huh? Like, like, people will just, oh, he's wearing a black shirt. He must be from Michigan. Oh, he's wearing reading glasses. He must be from Michigan. So <laughs> CJ Travel says, you can most definitely live in an RV. I've been living in a class A for almost a decade. What did it cost you? That's rule number one. Question number one. Question number two is, do you ever find yourself doing repairs on it that the average person wouldn't want to do to a brand new RV because they thought they deserved better? Because living full time in a lesser RV is what I'm talking about. Uh, my good friend, uh, Mark Lieberman, has got a Prevo, a big old like tour bus motor coach. It's got granite countertops. Yes, you can live in that thing if you wanted to. You could. Uh, I'm talking about the things that, you know, cost less money and are put together very, very quickly. Dan Busey, have you heard anything new on Jay Leno's turbine engine rebuild? Yes. Um, I was out at my brother's facility where he works, where they're doing work on the engine. And um, they are making major progress. And they have uh, got all the parts done. And they're now slowly putting it back together again. And they've got a couple of things they're very, very wary of. They're very concerned about. Um, Zin Raddy says he's a Michigander. He must be from Michigan. <laughs> it's like stating the obvious, you know. Wolfie, he's a lawyer. He must be from Michigan. Um, and so they are slowly putting it together. There's a chance. There's a chance that they could actually fire it up to see if it runs uh, in the near future. I hate to put time frames on that only because my brother won't. But I know that they've tracked down all the equipment they need, all the materials they need. They think they've got it. But there's a bunch of tests they want to run as they put it together to make sure everything is working just right. So, ooh, careful. Hey, who put that there? And uh, I know that some of the old school guys from Chrysler are um, helping them with that. Michael Hagberg, what's the story behind pizza is not a crime. Uh, that bumper sticker was sent to me by the people involved in the story in Ohio who had a pizza oven in their backyard. And um, the neighbors called the police on them, and they were put on trial for it as if the oven was creating a nuisance and they wound up winning. I believe, I, I think it was a lawsuit. I think they won the lawsuit. And um, so that's, that's, they sent me that sticker pizza, pizza's not a crime. Uh, Ghost Janice drove a class A Winnebago from Alaska to Florida. Then three years later, back to Alaska, the Thor didn't even make it 50 miles before problems. Yeah. And Thor, I think is one of those big companies that have been buying up a lot of other companies. So it's kind of hard to follow along as to which brand it is that you're looking for. Um, Nathan J, Steve's a YouTuber. He must be from Canada. <laughs> Michael Wallace and Chrysler make their own turbine or buy one. They made their own. They had a turbine department from 1953 to 1988. And they uh, made them all in-house, uh, all their own designs and everything. So they did not buy the turbines from anybody else. So there you go. Um, by the way, I wrote a book on the Chrysler turbine car, in case you didn't know that. So go to Amazon and look up Steve Leto. you find a list of books. Tay Zande, any interaction will leave you at a loss for words. Uh, I'm rarely accused of being at a loss for words. <laughs> I suppose I've been shocked a few times. But uh, I can't think of it at the top of my head. But thank you for checking in. Tay checks in quite a bit, and I get notices regarding that. And uh, he, he's he got a cool channel as well. So I say as well, because I think I can call my, my channel cool when I'm talking about myself. So 
Tim White, what's the weirdest of the weird laws on the books in Michigan? Uh, I'm not really sure. And I got to tell you that a lot of those weird law websites aren't real. They just make stuff up. So if it's against the law to chain an animal to a fire hydrant, they'll go, hey, do you know that in Battle Creek, it's illegal to chain an elephant to a fire hydrant? Well, technically it is, but that's not what the law says, right? So um, getting back to this, Neuropilot, not cheap, but there are companies that make custom turbine wheels, et cetera, if needed. Well, the engine is being rebuilt right now by Williams International, which is a jet engine manufacturer. So trust me, they've got all the expertise they need. So, um, yeah. But um, as for the, the silly laws, there was a thing going around the Internet about five years ago that is illegal in the state of Michigan for a woman to get her hair cut without asking for her husband's permission. And there's no such law. Someone just made that up. Someone just made it up. So I did a video entitled Woman Haircut Michigan. And so if you now do a Google search for woman haircut Michigan law, you get my video saying this is not a real thing, <laughs> which really bums people out because they like to think there's crazy laws. Did you know that it's illegal to eat ice cream while naked on a train in Illinois? Really? Okay. Okay. So um, Chris M. Oh, wow. Tay Zonday is freaking everywhere. <laughs> Jason Johnson, bring back the Sunday live. I might, I might, uh, you know, it, it, I hate to commit to something and say, I will do these at this time because schedules, you know? And so right now it turns out the last few weeks, I've had time in the afternoon on Fridays and I see it coming. I go, yeah, Friday off, Friday off. So I'll do Fridays for a little while, but we'll see how it goes. What's one of the more obscure laws you've used in court? Uh, Borcus. Um, most of the laws I use in court are obscure. I go into court and I start talking about the lemon law and judges are like, what now? And um, I've had judges on more than one occasion actually ask me, what exactly does this? Do you have a, you know, and I mean, they got the law books too, but I can tell you that I was in court not so long ago. Uh, it wasn't a lemon law case. It was involving a defective ATV. And at one point in time, the judge started grilling me on the record about express warranties and implied warranties and all of this stuff. And the judge goes, Okay, Mr. Leto, I'm going to go back in my chambers. I'm going to do some research, and I'm going to come out, and I'll answer your questions. I'd, I'd ask for a ruling on something. And so she left the room. We all stood up. We're standing there. And her clerk comes in, walks over to my, my, my table, and she goes, excuse me, Mr. Leto. Yeah, she goes, do you have a copy of that law? The judge is looking, and she can't find it. <laughs> so I go, here you go. And I handed it to her. The judge came back out and ruled in my favor. Um, so obscure laws or not, if they're on the books, they're still good. So Sarah Callahan's Sunday lives are awesome. Thank you very much. Robert Adams, any update on the four corners trespassing? Um, you know something that case might never end. And I forgot what the most recent one was because there've been lawsuits and criminal claims and appeals. I I've lost track of it. Steven Anderson wanted to, just wanted you for your support. I was just thank you for your support in the Institute for Justice. And by the way, um, if you get a chance, look ij.org, the Institute for Justice, they do great work. And, and I mean, they're amazing, the stuff they do, but they survive entirely by donations from people. Uh, are you selling signed copies of the Turban book? Any first printings left? Well, it came out in hardcover. The hardcovers are no longer available. Uh, I've got a couple paperbacks still available, and I've got a stack of Tucker books. The Tucker book on Preston Tucker and this battle to build the car of tomorrow. So if you want either of those books, all you got to do is email me. And I'll give you the email address right here. Steve at latoslaw.com. Make sure I spelled that correctly. Email me and put book in the subject line and say which book you want. Uh, the book's 20 bucks. Both those books are 20 bucks. I will sign it, put it in an envelope, and I'll mail it to you. And that includes the postage. So... Rusty Carter, are you ever going to spend the $100 bill? No, I can never spend that bill. That bill is going to last forever. Neuropilot, have you ever had to cite a precedent from a case that you argued before? Sort of. I was co-counsel on a case that was, um, uh, actually, if you, if you were to do a search through the legal books out there, uh, my name appears in a bunch of cases uh, where I was working at the firm that handled the case. 
uh, two big cases. One was a, a Lemon Law case called Ayer versus Ford. One was a pseudo Lemon Law case called Jordan versus Transnational. Um, and then there's a couple of cases that I had on the Court of Appeals that I was of counsel, you know, the actual counsel on, but they're not cited that often because they're very obscure cases. So uh, Cody Finello says, I appreciate you delivering the news in an unbiased fashion and on a regular basis. Years ago, you got me hooked on this channel by covering civil asset forfeiture and how insane it is. It's crazy that it's still happening. And it is. And I had somebody very recently say, Steve, I don't understand why you attorneys don't do anything about it. Well, attorneys are doing stuff about it. But the problem is that you can file these lawsuits and judges throw them out. Attorneys can't, like in the grand scheme of rock, paper, scissors, okay, judges always beat attorneys. And so the judges keep beating the attorneys saying, you can't do that because this is a good law. The law's got to change, which happens at a much higher level than just attorneys like me handling cases. So civil asset forfeiture should be done away with, but it's going to take legislation to do it at the state level and the federal level. So thank you very much. But I, I'm glad that people, I remember the very, very first time I talked about civil asset forfeiture. It was a case called Do Not Travel With Cash or something like that. And people responded by going, this can't be real. This can't be real. And it was real. And now, of course, all these years later, everybody on the channel knows about it. So there you go. Uh, Ghost Shadow says that uh, got one of my books for his sister-in-law, and she loves it. Well, I'm I'm glad. I'm glad she did. C. Patterson, I worked on the movie Tucker many years ago. Um, Tucker, the Man in the Dream was by Francis Ford Coppola, uh, and that came out a few years ago. It's actually a pretty good movie. Surprisingly uh, done well uh, for a Hollywood movie, uh, because most Hollywood movies, as you know, don't stick to facts that closely. So um, I've met members of the Tucker family who've said they nailed it with Jeff Bridges and his uh, personification of what type of guy Preston Tucker was. That's exactly it. So Michael Wallace, what's the highest court you've appealed to? I've sent, uh, sent appeals to the Michigan Supreme Court, but they've never accepted one of mine for hearing. Uh, but I've had a bunch of cases heard by the Michigan Court of Appeals, a whole bunch. And I've even won cases at the circuit court that were appealed to the district court. <laughs> Strange. So, uh, Laura Thompson, can you tell a story about your honor? My client doesn't manufacture cars. We only assemble them. <laughs> I did a video called like the dumbest things lawyers ever said to me or dumbest things that I had lawyers say in court. And in the lemon law, it says specifically, you don't sue the dealer on a lemon law claim, you sue the manufacturer. And the manufacturer is defined in the statute as one who manufactures or assembles from parts, automobiles that are sold brand new, blah, 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 blah. And this attorney filed a motion to have my case dismissed and said, uh, your honor, we are not a manufacturer. We are merely an assembler of parts. And I called the attorney up and said, you understand stupid argument. I mean, I, I hate to say it to another attorney, but you're making a stupid argument. She goes, well, that's my client. My client wants me to make the argument. And I'm like, okay. So we go into court, and that's pretty much the discussion in front of the judge. Judge you know, goes, okay, what, what's your issue? Well, we're just an assembler of parts. And I'm like, your honor, look at the definition. An assembler of parts is a manufacturer. The judge goes, uh, definition. An assembler of parts is a manufacturer. The judge goes, uh, yeah. Uh, why do you disagree with that now? She's like, well, my client wants me to make the argument. Uh, that's not good enough. Um, you, you're supposed to be making arguments that are good faith arguments. Drew K75, hello from Bay City. Bay City's over here, not far from Saginaw. I worked in Saginaw for a while, the radio station, WKNX. Big Red just got my copy, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. Boom. I mentioned that last week. I just read the book uh, by Dan Everett called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes. It is an amazing amazing book about a guy who went down and, and spent time with a, uh, a tribe in the Amazon. I'm not going to get too heavily into it now, but it's a, a lot of linguistic stuff and a lot of real interesting questions about how we interact with other people, not people in our society, but people in other societies. And it's a fascinating book. There's a documentary out there called The uh, Grammar of Happiness, a couple other documentaries about it. Also, you can find interviews with Dan Everett on YouTube. 
uh, articles written about it. It was a big, big deal. And the book came out, but I think the book didn't do so well because the title is odd. Don't sleep. There are snakes. Tim Nossum, didn't Rick Snyder eliminate a bunch of old Michigan laws like dueling and using profanity? Um, I don't rightly remember that. I do remember there have been occasions where they say they've gone through and cleaned up some old laws, but I, I don't remember specifically. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. The tricky part is you've got to find laws that people will agree with removing because there are still some laws on the books in some states that are blue laws that have more to do with religious and morality reasons than anything else. So Kevin Jurgens, what's your favorite university shirt you have worn in your videos and how do you acquire them? People send them in. I, uh, I, I almost all the shirts are sent in. Now I'll admit the university of Michigan football ones. I bought my own money. I've also, um, uh, Oakland University shirts that I went through for my undergrad and also Southwestern University Law School shirts, which I've worn as well on camera. But almost every other shirt I wear on camera for a school was sent into me. I wore one the other day and I forgot the name of the school, but the but the <laughs> the mascot is the keel haulers. And the guy who sent me the shirt said, just to let you know, we're the only school in the nation whose mascot is named after a torture or punishment. And I thought, well, I, I, I can see that. <laughs> Keel haulers. So that's a good one. I liked wearing the Ohio State shirt because it freaked a lot of people out. But I said specifically that I'll only wear the Ohio State shirt when it's not football season. And in football season, I will not wear it. So, you know, I, I am big. I am big on universities and education and teaching. And so I've got a lot of respect for schools. So I've told people, if you actually are for a, you know, from a real school or sending me a shirt from a real school, I'll wear it. I, I, I no problems at all. No problems at all. Um, Brent Adams says, hey, Steve, watching the 48 hours episode about Timothy Masters as you speak. Very interesting. Yeah, um, I wrote a book about Timothy Masters with Timothy Masters called Drawn to Injustice. I've got copies of that also, by the way, if anybody wants one of those. Uh, he's the guy who spent 10 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. And then got out, sued the people who put him in prison, and won a very large settlement from all the defendants. And now um, I'm friends with the guy. He's a very, very nice guy. Uh, it's been a little while since I talked to him, although I did send him pictures of my Cobra because he likes cars. And um, the 48 hours thing, I have mixed feelings about. Because originally, they did one about his conviction and pointed out how what a great job the prosecutors did. They, they, they convicted this guy of murder. And they did it with so very little evidence. And then when he got out, they, they redid it and said, oh, 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 he was framed and he got out. Look at this great story. And it's like, wait, what about the earlier time when you did a story about how he was convicted and the prosecutors were geniuses? <laughs> so you have to understand the prosecutors walked out of his courtroom when he was convicted for a murder he did not commit. And they were high-fiving each other and they held a press conference. And now you look at those high fives and you want to punch somebody. And that's putting it mildly. And uh, I have to tell you, by the way, for people who ask me, Timothy Masters is one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my entire life. I've spent time with him. I've hung out with him. I've gone driving with him. Uh, talked to him for hours and hours and hours. I know more about him because I've read his files on his cases and on his appeals and the criminal file. I've read all this stuff. and. I was talking to him one day after I got to know him really well. And I said, I have to ask you this, Tim. I said, if I was you, if I was in your position, I was convicted of a crime I did not commit, a heinous murder, and spent 10 years in a maximum security prison every single day thinking I might never get out. And after 10 years, I got out. And I proved that I'd been framed by bad people trying to put me away. I go, I don't think I'd be as mellow as you are right now. I said, I said, I, 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 I have to salute you, but I'm curious. How do you, how do you explain that to me? Can you explain that to me? And he said, Steve, he goes, I knew I was innocent and I was convinced I was going to get out eventually. Now he, I'm not sure if he ever gave up hope, but he knew that it was long odds. 
But he goes, when I realized it's getting out, I made the mental decision that I was going to leave all of that emotional baggage behind. Not going to forget it happened, but I'm not going to carry it around and let it be a weight on my shoulders. They took 10 years from me. They're not taking any more years from me. And that was it. And so I, I could not, I could not do that. I, I, that, that, that is not how I would have responded. So, but he's a great guy. Nathan L. Love your video, Steve. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Moments in trading. Officer, my cell phone battery died. Can you charge it with a crime? <laughs> Rick Gal 50. First time I'm on your live chat. Well, it's the first live I've done in a little while, other than the one I did last week. So I've done two recently, and that's it. Oh, boy. Dirk Romswinkle, how many emails do you receive per day? Um, my email address probably gets several thousand a day, but the spam filters and everything else um, get rid of a lot of that stuff. Uh, but I skim them to see what they're about, and that's, I, that's all I can do. Christopher C, do you still metal detect, still using whites? I talked about this at the top, believe it or not. Yes, I've got a whites V3i I mainly use. If whites went out of business, haven't been out yet this year. It's still too cold, but I'll get out. Last year, I got out a couple of times uh, and found a couple Indian head pennies. The year before, I found a large scent, buffalo nickel, and four Indian head pennies in one stretch of a sidewalk tear out, not far from where my P.O. box is. And somebody just commented on my Breitling. Thank you very much. So... CT Sega says, how would you send a shirt? Uh, send it to my PO box. Uh, I wear a double XL. Here we go. XXL. Uh, and it goes to P. Hold on. PO box 168, comma, Atlas, Michigan 48411. Boom. So is that right? Yeah, that's it. So send shirts there as long as they're not political or obscene. I'll wear them. Um, Jake from State Farm, how many T-shirts do you think you have now? I've got about 150 uh, over there. And um, I've got mm, probably 1,000, 2,000, something like that. So lackluster. It's always neat to see a set from a different angle. Would not have guessed the room looked like that. <laughs> That's a lot of junk behind this wall. A lot of junk in front of the wall, too, by the way. So... Uh, Burning sensations, extended auto warranty emails. No, I get a ton of emails going, dear website owner, uh, did you know that that uh, Google does not have you listed at all? If you pay us, we can get you listed with Google. And I mean, I get the same email 10 times a day. And you can sit there, block, 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 block. And they just, they just use different email addresses. And I, I don't even know what they're doing. Like, why would they do this? Like, I don't get what the point is. It's, it's almost like just vandalism, being harassed like that. So, um, what of? Love you, Steve. So very glad you're doing these live chats again. Really missed them. Dirk Romslinkle, what's your favorite widget? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Is widget originally, originally was the abstract concept. Since then, people have named things widgets. Every time I mention what a widget is, people go, uh, Steve, a widget's actually a thing that Guinness makes to help you pour a beer. Well, yeah, that's what they took the name. They took the name from the, the, the nondescript thing that doesn't exist. So Paul Tech Corner says that's a phishing scam. It very well could be. Uh, Stizzle Swick, why would you want to list with Google? I think you're talking about showing up in search results. I do want people to be able to find me if they're looking for me on, on, on the Google. So Jonathan Bayer says, Steve, I contacted you a while back about including a recording of yours in a mod of mine for Kerbal Space Program. I released it a few months ago. Oh, okay. I'm not sure how would I go about seeing it or hearing that. So Michael Wallace, is there a 500K for Sunday push? I, I wish there was a way to do that, but I don't know how to. I don't know how to do that. Um, I mean, if I could get more people to sign up, I would. <laughs> they sign up when they sign up. By the way, just so you know, I'm about to hit 500,000 subs. The day I hit 250 
for those of you who follow along know that a couple years ago, I got to go to Jay Leno's garage with my brother and my father. And Jay took us for a ride in a Duesenberg because my dad loves Duesenbergs. And I shot a video and I put the video on my channel, did very, very well. And the morning that we went to his garage, I woke up that morning and actually opened up my YouTube app and it said subscribers 249999. I went 250001. It rolled over to 250 that morning. So I actually went onto Facebook and said, oh, look at this, 250,000 subscribers. This day couldn't get any better, could it? <laughs> and of course, an hour later, I'm at Jay Leno's garage walking around his 200 car collection or whatever it is. So that's a good day. So I remember the day I hit 250. 300, 350, not so much. 500, I'll probably remember that. But 250 was an important day because I was in California in lovely downtown Burbank. Kalija Anderson, nice to see you live. We've been enjoying your content for years now. Please keep it up. Thank you very much. By the way, it's fascinating to see these greetings from names I don't recognize because I know there's a lot of people who watch me, may not comment, may not chime in, but they're there. And, and that's the deceptive thing about YouTube is yesterday I had 700,000 views on my channel in, 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 uh, in one day, 700,000. How many people commented? A couple thousand, but that's just a fraction, such a small fraction. Have you been a good driver since your last pullover, JW? <laughs> last time I got pulled over a couple years ago, a couple days before New Year's Eve, I was driving through a really small town. Cop pulled me over. I did the whole thing that you're supposed to do. I know this because I made a video about it. Turn the dome light on, shut the car off, hands on the wheel with the window already rolled down. And the cop walks up and goes, uh, driver's license registration. And I said, I'm going to reach for it. It's in my wallet. He goes, go right ahead. As I'm reaching for it, he goes, you haven't been drinking, have you? And I go, no, I don't drink. And he goes, eh. And I think I handed him the license registration, but he, but he handed it back. And I go, uh, why'd you pull me over? And he goes, well, earlier, he goes, I think, I think you hit the fog line, which I didn't. And he goes, but he goes, I'm actually looking for drunk drivers. Don't worry about it. And it, 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 was, it was just, he was pulling everybody over because I hadn't done anything wrong. I wasn't speeding. And I'll tell you right now, since then, I've blown by a couple of cops trying to look at my speedometer and go, am I going to get ticketed for that? <laughs> so moments in trading. You mean we all can see you, but you can't see all of us? That's exactly right. It's like a one-way mirror. It's kind of scary if you think about it. Wisdom rules. Huva, paiva. Uh, good day. I, I think I'm close on that. Yeah, Paul's tech course is one ironic fact is if you're emailing about your Google listing like that, it means it's showing up. That is how they found you. Of course, they could also be buying lists of email addresses. I'm assuming once you get on one of those lists, they just sell it, resell it, resell it. So, Thomas Hines, a question. Other than locking your doors and windows, how do you prevent a hostile takeover of your home with squatters, especially going on vacation? Security cameras and neighbors. You don't understand. Those things are important because you can get security cameras that you can watch on your phone. So if somebody were to come up and knock on the door to your house, you'd know. And you could then follow it and see, you know, what's happening. Likewise, if you've got neighbors you trust, tell them, by the way, I'm going on vacation. Could you watch my house for a couple of days? Just let me know if you see like moving trucks pull up, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's the key. Uh, cameras and neighbors. So Steve Rosenland, how do you avoid becoming a narcissist with your own show for so long? It's, it's actually a funny concept if you work in media, especially if you work where you can see yourself or listen to yourself. You do start spending a lot of time hearing yourself, and you have to learn how to not take yourself too seriously. And so if you ever watch my videos and you catch me cracking a joke that is self-deprecating or I'm making fun of myself, that's one way I do that is I, I try to remind myself that you know, <laughs> I make mistakes. Uh, I'm getting older, um, things like that. So there you go. 
Uh, Andrew Gilbertson, hi, Steve, from Midlands, England. Thank you for checking in. At least we speak the same language. Jeopardy 4100, Cobras make you want to go faster. Um, how can I say this? I was driving my Cobra down to visit some friends. I was going to visit my brother at Williams International. And I was driving down I-75 and I had to make a merge. And I had to merge. And, and, I, and I just stepped in the gas a little bit. And I merged past a bunch of people. And I looked down and I was kind of surprised at how far that needle had gone to the right. Let's put it, let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, so yeah, in Russia, Steve pulls over cops. <laughs> Toward Jesus. Oh boy. T O F M drone, Belgium reporting in. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. CT Sagas has been following you since the early Jalopnik days. And don't forget, before I was in Jalopnik, I was on opposite lock. I was actually on opposite lock first. And what happened was I wrote Tom McParlin, who does car buying uh, for Jalopnik. Um, he called me with a question one day and I gave him an answer. And he goes, would you like to write uh, for sites like this? I said, yeah. And he goes, what you should do is he goes, start writing stuff for opposite lock. I'll get you on there. So he got me on there. And I used to post things on opposite lock, big, long pieces, and at least longer than a lot of the other pieces that got posted there. And um, uh, started getting some really good numbers. In fact, a couple pieces I put on opposite lock had hundreds of thousands of downloads. And they finally said, would you like to write directly for Jalopnik? I said, sure. So there was a time where I'd write one piece a week for Jalopnik and three or four for opposite lock. And I think it kind of annoyed one of, one of the editors there, I think, got annoyed with me because he would think, like, I'm not going to put Steve's piece up. He's going to put it up tomorrow. And then I would put up a piece and would get 200,000 views. And he, what, what's he going to say? Stop putting up popular stuff. Um, but what also helped me at the time was the guy who was the editor of Lifehacker was a friend of mine. I actually knew the guy. And he read my stuff. And he would routinely take my stuff and repost it on Lifehacker. So a piece of mine from Opposite Lock would be on Lifehacker and get like half a million views. <laughs> and I know that bothered some people, but I, you know, the writing for Opposite Lock and Jalopnik was just like a really distantly side hobby. It's really all it was. Michael Lawless, who are some of your favorite YouTube creators and channels? Uh, I've mentioned this before. Um, I actually like chess videos. And I know that some people think watching chess videos is going to be boring. But if it's done right, so Agadmeter, there's a guy from, I think, Croatia, Antonio, Antonio uh, Agadmeter, uh, who's got a chess channel with over a million subscribers. He's really, really good. I also like uh, Anna Kramling. And if you know who I'm talking about, it's a woman from Norway who is extremely good now, she just played in a tournament where she didn't do that well, but she was playing over the board classical chess. She'll go to like New York City with a camera and take on street hustlers in like three minute games. And she is so fun to watch because she's good. She's good natured. She will win. She will lose. It doesn't matter to her. And it's just fun to watch. And then when she was doing the over the board tournament, her mother was live streaming it and commenting in real time. And it was fascinating because her mother is a grandmaster. So Pia Kramling, the mother, was talking along with the video feed of the board. And she would explain everything. And a few times she'd say things like, oh my gosh, Anna's got this move. If she simply does this, if she simply does this, and then she'd do it. And you realize, oh wait, that's because she taught her how to play chess. It was brilliant. And so there's a couple of guys. Uh, there's also Chess Vibes. Uh, and he's got a, a little bit smaller of a channel. Like say Agadmator. Really, really nice guy. I've spoken to him before, believe it or not. Uh, and he just has a great way of explaining chess. And he also loves putting up puzzles. You know, put up a puzzle and go, okay, this is a mate in three. Pause it and see if you can figure it out. If not, he waits a second and then he'll explain it to you. And so it is, it is a lot of fun. BV Luminous, those two are really great to witness. I assume you're talking about the Kramlings. I agree 100%. Uh, Michael Frank Kowiak says the Botez sisters play chess online too. I've not followed them, but I've seen their name pop up from time to time. Um, 
Meadow says, I think she's also appeared on some poker live streams. Yeah, I've watched some poker also, but I like to watch poker highlights. If you're watching poker in real time and there's a bunch of boring hands, eh, it's not as much fun to me. But if you go watch like the five craziest quad flops, you know, things like that, those can be a lot of fun to watch. Monkey standing last, I'm sorry, Monk standing last says, hey, Steve, she's good looking too, referring to Anna Kremlin. I hadn't noticed. <laughs> so are the Botez sisters, I believe. Oh, boy. Ian Ireland says, how come you can go to law school in a California school and practice law in Michigan? Interestingly, uh, if you get a JD, which is a law degree, from any accredited law school in America, you can then take the bar in any state as long as you pass their requirements and then practice in that state. So if I had wanted to, I could have stayed in California, applied to their bar, taken their bar, and if I passed their bar, I could then have passed and practiced in California. I chose not to do that. I came back to Michigan, took the Michigan bar, did all the requirements of the Michigan bar, and became a lawyer here. I've known many lawyers who went to school in other states. So that's not uncommon at all. In fact, you know a lot of people We'll go to Harvard and then come back to wherever they came from to practice. So there you go. Betty Boops is Queen's Gambit on Netflix. That was pretty good also. Uh, it had some issues, but to dramatize a story about a chess prodigy is very, very difficult. And I thought they did a pretty good job with it. I watched it and very, uh, very much enjoyed it at the time. Um, Michael Lawless did Williams get the original drawings and docks of Turbine Engine. Uh, they've got a lot of them. So they're the ones who are repairing the engine in Jay Leno's turbine car. And to do that, they have gotten a lot of help from the old school guys from Chrysler. And I've seen that they've got these full size, literal one-to-one -one drawings of the engine, for instance, every single bit and piece on the engine. So. Christer Renstrom says, Anna Kremling is half Swedish and half Spanish. Yes, I believe her father is Spanish. Um, although I think if she's asked, I think like, isn't she a, a, a Swedish citizen and so on? Does she play for Sweden when she plays in tournaments? I think that's true, but I could be wrong. Haney Yoki, 14. Hi, Steve. Hi, Haney Yoki, 14. <laughs> Drew K, 75. I know you bike and run. Do you participate in other sports? Pickleball, tennis. No, I don't. I used to play some indoor soccer, but, um, have not done that lately. Those games are always ruined by the one or two guys who don't understand it's supposed to be fun. We're having fun here. I was playing in an indoor soccer league in Novi about 15 years ago, and I got a clean break on the goalie. It's just me and the goalie. And the score is like eight to five. It's indoor soccer. And a guy ran up behind me and tackled me like it's a football game. Literally jumped on me, arms around me, and tackled me. And the ref penalized him for two minutes. And I'm like, dude, I'm bleeding here. And the ref's like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, throw him out of the game and report him to the management. The guy's crazy. No, we don't do that. So I haven't played there for science. And I, I, I won't because I, I can't risk being injured by an idiot who doesn't understand we're there to have fun. I run too many risks just mountain biking. <laughs> Look for the video I have that's entitled, I went to court looking like this. And the thumbnail is a picture of me holding up my arm. It's actually this arm in a cast, and I've got half my face scraped off. Um, husky accomplice. The question is, husky an adjective or a dog? Husky accomplice. Hey, Steve, thank you for keeping us educated and entertained. I listen to your videos while commuting. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. A lot of people tell me that they listen, but let's face it. <laughs> you don't really need to see this, do you? <laughs> oh, boy. Built on the Rock Homestead, my mom was an attorney in California. Her best friend was practicing in California and moved to Florida and took several people who are like that. Um, a, a very good friend of mine uh, is licensed both in Michigan and Florida, uh, Brian Parker, who I've talked about before, and also another friend of mine um, uh, who lives in Orlando is licensed both in Florida and Michigan. Lowell Rigsium asks about Frank, Ab Frank Abagnale, and somebody else apparently mentioned him too. Frank Abagnale is a liar. He is a pathological liar. 
Uh, and he made up not just the scams he ran, but the stories about the scams. So he never passed the bar. He never took the bar. He never practiced law. He probably never practiced medicine. It turns out that, for instance, the place he claimed where he was the head of pediatric medicine didn't have a pediatric pediatrics department. He just made stuff up and people believed it because the story was good. And I can tell you that somebody asked the filmmakers of Catch Me If You Can, do you understand the story is not true? And they said, it doesn't matter. It's a good story. But people think it's real. Well, that's not our fault. So there are books that have been written that totally 100% debunk 99% of what appears in his book, uh, in his book, and it's just nonsense. Brad Moore, hey, Steve, love your channel. I see what appears to be a guitar amp behind you. Do you play and what style is your favorite? What's the guitar amp? I don't have a guitar amp behind me. Um, there's stuff behind me. I'm trying to see if there's a... No, <laughs> I don't play the guitar. I have no musical talent whatsoever. Um, Vogons are scared of towels as earthbound misfit, misfit. I don't know about that, but their poetry is horrible. <laughs> Oh, boy. And let's see what else. Um, hello from Dana Point, California, Space Cowboy. Thank you for checking in. Is that near uh, Laguna? Let's see here. I enjoy the hunt for the $100 bill. Douglas Deaton, sometimes more than the video. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Um over your left shoulder against the wall. This shoulder? I'm not sure what you'd be seeing back there. I don't, I don't, I, don't, I, I do not have a guitar amplifier back there. Um, Bob Jones, do you like rap music? <laughs> not generally, not generally, but I will tell you that I will make the argument that Straight Outta Compton by NWA was a groundbreaking album just as important to the history of rock and roll as many of the other important albums that people say like, well, what about Sgt. Pepper? And you have to understand, you might not like it, but what that album did was so groundbreaking. And those guys, what they were singing about was actual injustice that they encountered on the streets of Compton. And when I was in law school, a friend of mine brought the tape in and said, Steve, listen to this. And I go, what's this? He goes, it's a band out of Compton. And they're so controversial that every time they play, the FBI shows up and watches and make sure they don't like get out of control. Which of course, that was the best thing that ever happened to them to, to wind up on a watch list and, and it got publicized. Police departments were told, if NWA comes to town, you got to watch them. The second the word gets out, it's like, oh my gosh, we gotta go see these bands to see what see what they're all about. <laughs> Straight out of Compton. I can actually wrap the entire thing for you right now, but I won't. <laughs> but Terry's workbench says preach NWA. So Jake from the State Farm says, for me, it was public enemies, fear of a black planet. So keep in mind, rap predates obviously NWA, but the gangster rap uh, that was the label given to it. Uh, was invented by them. Other people came along and copied it. I think they copied it poorly. Many of them did. And were simply acting outraged to act outraged. But, but the point is that these guys actually were legitimately aggrieved and they wrote music about it. And somebody just said, doesn't matter, I'll never support them. Um, you don't have to support them. But my point is that if somebody is upset by something, they could go march in the streets. They could start throwing stuff or they could write music. Which would you rather have them do? I'd rather have them write music given those options. So, um, Hakey DTW straight out of beta degree. <laughs> if that's a beta degree in the UP, that is straight out of left field. Oh boy. Oh, Sizzleator. Hey, Steve, one, thank you for your rock rooster at a while back. It was nice to trust someone's endorsement and not be disappointed. Thank you for all that you do. Yeah, 
Uh, Rock Rooster puts out good stuff. In fact, I've run a couple ads some recently on the audio version of my podcast simply because I got to put something in there once in a while. Uh, they make great stuff. I've got five pairs of their shoes and or footwear. It's great stuff. Marion K. Cavusi is checking in and donates a banana peel uh, to the stream as far as uh, uh, images go. That's great. Um, Bill says, Anna Kramling, born in Spain, lives in Sweden. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, what I'm curious about is when she's sitting at a table playing chess, I believe she had a, a Swedish flag there. That's what I thought. I could be wrong. So, Bob Jones, I like rap. I like classical. Hey, you want something? Um, there's good music in almost every genre. I will admit, I've never heard a polka song where I said, boy, I like a copy of that. Um, but I've got some classical music I love. Uh, I'll tell you right now, one of the best uh, biographies I ever read was the biography of Mozart by Maynard Solomon. Uh, and it's a masterpiece. And uh, Mozart's music to me is fabulous. I don't listen to it a lot, but occasionally I do. And so uh, I can find good music in almost any genre. But like I said, polka is still, I, no one's ever quite gotten me a polka song. Said, Steve, you got to hear this one. This one will change your mind on that. Uh, MD Hofsky says, have you heard of Weird Al and his rapping? Of course, of course. Weird Al is a genius. He is absolute genius. And I remember his early stuff. And some of it was so weird. And I believe, and at least the story is, that he got started sending in his music on cassettes to Dr. Demento. And I believe it was another one, Rides the Bus, that he put out first. And uh, using that as a springboard, then, of course, wound up putting out albums. And uh, he has a great way of laughing at himself. He's appeared in Naked Gun movies, for instance. <laughs> the way I do it, what music do you listen to while eating frozen lasagna? I just listen to the, 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 the pounding pulse of my veins in my head getting ready to explode. <laughs> JP, we're going to polka like at $16.99. <laughs> Jay Hallerad, I had a huge obsession with Mozart in the fifth grade. People don't understand what Mozart did and what, what he was capable of doing. And uh, it, it, it helps if you understand classical music a little bit. I'm, I'm not a musician. I can't read music. I'm tone deaf. But when you read what he did at the ages he did it uh, and understand he was not just a once in a lifetime talent. He was not even a once in a generation talent. He was a once in a humanity talent. There will probably never be a composer and musical genius on the scale of Mozart uh, as long as there are humans on the earth. I, I, I think that there's people who would say that that's actually something that's a defensible argument. Now, Jim says, how about Prince? Uh, I really liked Prince. Um, I had Prince's 1999. Um, and I remember getting that. Uh, I believe I got it when I lived in Bad Axe, Michigan. I'm listening to country music at work and listening to Prince at home. <laughs> and 1999 and Purple Rain uh, were fabulous. Some of his later stuff I didn't really care so much about. The guy was obviously a showman. He put on a great show. Uh, it's tragic uh, the way he passed. I believe that he had some issues. And I believe he's surrounded by yes people. And I think that uh, Michael Jackson had much the same problem in that Michael Jackson had so much money and fame and power that no one would ever tell him no. And so when he asked a doctor, well, can you like just knock me out instead of you know helping me get to sleep? The doctor's like, sure. And uh, that's not how you're supposed to do that. So T.T. Bones' video game music is my go-to music. What's fascinating about that is a lot of songs now that get discovered it used to be listen to the radio and they play new music. And you'd hear a song go, oh, I like that song. You hear it a few times, you go out and you buy it maybe, right? Okay. No one listens to the radio these days. I, I haven't listened to terrestrial radio in five minutes in, like, in a day for like 10 years. Now, I have a Sirius XM satellite receiver in my truck, but I listen to different channels on there, and it's they're skewed. So if a band came out today with a new song, I might never hear it. But I've heard of songs that have gotten airplay not on radio stations, but were put into soundtracks to video games. 
and have gotten a second life that way. And so, like, for instance, Alan Walker's Faded, I believe, was in the soundtrack to something. I don't know what it was, but all I know is, look it up, it's a song called Faded by Alan Walker, and uh, it's got billions, with a B, billions of views. And um, uh, it was partly because of its presence in a video game. But it's a good song. It's a great song. Marion Norton says Beethoven was on Mozart's level. I disagree. Beethoven was good. Bach was good. Bach was groundbreaking. But you have to remember the things that Mozart did when he's a child, for instance. You know, so uh, have you heard Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer? I've not heard the version by Diupers. I've heard the original version, which is like Patsy and somebody. I forgot. I, I played that song a thousand times when I was on the radio. So James says, I think it takes at least 300 CDs. 80 minutes each to record the complete works of Mozart. Probably. Mrs. Hayes is a cut from Kiss is the notification on my phone. Why isn't Purple Haze the notification on your phone? For the longest time, I had as the ringtone on my cell phone a clip of Chief Wiggums saying, I'm sorry, ma'am, it's not illegal to threaten to kill somebody. Oh, wait, it is. And it's also illegal to put squirrels down your pants for the purposes of gambling. Hey, guys, cut it out. <laughs> and I would be someplace, and my phone would ring, and that voice would be coming out of my pocket. And people would be going, what is that? It's illegal to threaten to kill somebody. And, of course, it's from The Simpsons. So uh, Cindy Mannion says, thoughts on the new Florida anti-squatter law? I have not read it, but I have heard about it, and it sounds good, but it still sounds like they give the squatter a little bit of time to get out. I honestly think that the squatter, once they're narked out, should have literally minutes to get out, not days, not weeks. It should be minutes, but we'll see. Betty Boop, is the old radio that you dj at still operating? Uh, yes, WLEW is still on the air uh, up in Bad Axe, Michigan, uh, playing country music on the AM. They're playing uh, more modern music on the FM. When I was there, it was beautiful music with no live DJs, but now it is on the FM. WKNX Saginaw is no longer on the air. Uh, WTRX Flint is on the air, but they're an all-talk sports station. CK105 is still there and still playing the hits. And uh, so not every station I ever worked at is out of business. <laughs> Over your right shoulder, under the window, looks like a guitar amp, but it ain't. So... That thing right there is a bookshelf. And underneath it are shelves and cars and a photograph of Mylon Wolfie and a photograph of Robbie Robertson, which he signed. Uh, I'm a big fan of Robbie Robertson's also. Uh, Burl Osborne, when you're coming back to the wall and DJ at WLLW, the wall. Uh, I'd like to do that. I'm not sure when. Uh, I've asked, again, if anybody out there has got a radio station would like to have me, you know, Come in and DJ. I'd like to do it, but um, <laughs> haven't got any offers yet. I'd really also like to do a talk show someplace. If somebody let me come into a station that still has live talk hosts and do like seven to midnight in some city and just answer questions and talk like a typical call in talk show program. I used to do that. I did that in, um, in Flint, but I also did it in Detroit for a while at the first FM talk station in Detroit, W O W F wow. FM Detroit left of the bookshelf left of the bookshelf is a folding chair and that's a folding chair it's wooden and it came from the uh italian hall it was there the night of the disaster pictures of you is my favorite cure song pictures of you is a good song uh i of course i like just like heaven um of course you know that's that's the go-to song uh but i like a bunch of their stuff um and i did not get to see them last time they're in town really angers me, but there's a whole thing about how you get tickets these days. So Sean Carroll says, were the engines used in the turbine cars repurposed aircraft? No, they were not. They were uh, purpose made for automobiles. Tim Nossum is Michelle McCormick still on the air in Michigan. I wouldn't know. Last I heard she was over in the Grand Rapids area someplace. Matinoir, if you do the talk radio, can you record it and post it? Probably. I probably could also stream it live, depending on where they put me. So Big Skid Media says you can do a talk show on YouTube. Yes, and I could also be a DJ on YouTube. That's not the, the point is 
I want to go back and do the old school thing with the old school audience and actually like people call in and talk. <laughs> None of you are talking to me right now. You're typing to me. <laughs> oh boy. A forest is my favorite track. Salty Sage, have you thought about doing a separate channel that does more in-depth analysis of topical cases and laws? I don't know. I don't know really do that well. Um, if they would, I'd put them on my main channel. Um, Species 1571, Steve will suddenly realize he does indeed have a guitar amp back there. What would it be doing back there? <laughs> uh, the wooden folding chair does look kind of like a guitar amp. Uh, you're talking about the little vertical things? Yeah, those are the wooden slats in the back of the uh, back of the chair. Rob Norris, did any of your brothers learn Finnish? No, unfortunately, none of us did. Um, Jim Skelding says a ghost, a ghost says greetings from Seberville. Yeah, Seberville is a town in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan where a couple of people got shot uh, in the summer of 1913 during the strike. And if you go there today, about 20 people live there, 25. Um, so... Uh, it's a neat little town, but it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Burning Sensations says, saw a cure in Frankfurt, November of 2022. A ticket was 68 euros. Question is, did you know there's a band called the Burning Sensations? They got a great song, a great song, Belly of the Whale. Uh, as a K-Rock song, K-R-O-Q Los Angeles. Played it quite a bit. The Burning Sensations. Brian Kremen, who do you recommend on YouTube for constitutional law topics? Uh, I'm not sure if I've ever actually looked into that specifically. Uh, Greg Pondell says, what was the fastest you ever drove a car in your early years? Please be honest. Remember the story of the 18-year-old going 155. Um, I've been in a car going fast, uh, but I wasn't driving. And uh, I can tell you that I know what a car looks like when it's going that fast, but um, I, I never did anything that, anything that crazy or stupid. Uh, Douglas Deaton, Steve, tell your producer. The live stream's a great idea. Thanks for sharing. Steve, it's the radio tube that has everyone confused. Um, there is on that bottom shelf right there, a Tucker automobile, and behind it is a radio tube, right? Oh, it's hard to do this backwards, right? There, that's a radio tube. And it's kind of like this radio tube right here, but that's another story altogether. Michael Lawless, when you DJed, what type of media was the music on? I played 45s at my first radio station. I played carts at my second radio station and my third radio station. My fourth radio station, we played CDs. And then when I, for instance, guest DJ at WLLW in New York uh, a couple of years ago, uh, everything was on a computer. So that finally was me catching up to <laughs> the present day. Rosdar, somebody says, have you ever done a burnout? Uh, yes, but, you know, burnouts don't do anything. The people who sit there and do burnouts and smoke their tires, I don't think that that's that fascinating. I'm not sure why people think it's cool. Now, if you can do a controlled slide and like a, a, a doing donuts – and you're spinning around, and that, that's kind of cool. But, I mean, I had somebody who saw the video of me driving the Chrysler Turban car. And they go, hey, dude, why'd you do a burnout in it, man? You're stupid. Yeah, I'll do a burnout in a $5 million car that doesn't belong to me. Guess how long that's going to last. So, <laughs> Julie Mumford, do you like sea shanties? <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever heard any, at least not recently. But I can tell you that I do like World War II military marching music. And, and I'll tell you that there's good marching music on both sides. And, and that's one of the interesting things about music is that it's not political in that sense. But there's there was some good, really good uh, militaristic marching songs from back in the day. Uh <sighs> Jim, have you ever met Richard Blade from First Wave? He was KROQ back in the day. No, I've never met him. I read his book. The book is on my bookshelf right here. Um, and he's on Sirius XM middays, afternoon. Uh, he used to do middays at KROQ. It's a fascinating story. He's from England. 
Um, and he's originally told, uh, you'll never be able to work in radio here because that goofy accent of yours. And he became an extremely popular disc jockey in Los Angeles. So um, he's, he's, he seems like a great guy. He knows a lot about the music, obviously, but I've never met him. So Nan CCC 70 hi from Virginia. Enjoy your broadcast very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. KMPM says, hi from Finland's Western neighbor. Mary Norton says, Sousa was among the best. Sousa's got a certain sound to it, you know? And I wonder how many Americans realize that the Monty Python theme was actually the, uh, was the Liber Liberty Bell March or something. But uh, most of us associate that with the Minister of Silly Walks. <laughs> Haney Yoki 14, the music of Wagner wasn't nearly as bad as it sounds, but it makes great music when being played from helicopters coming in low on a beach in a movie. <laughs> oh, boy. Steven Anderson points out that the songs by Afro Man, which are basically autobiographical, and yes, they are, and they're fascinating. <laughs> Dirk Romswinkle, many tanks for recommending White Tiger. White Tiger is a movie you can find, I think, on Amazon Prime. It's a strange movie. I'm the first to tell you that it's a strange movie. It's a Russian movie shot in Russia in the Russian language. It's subtitled. It's about a guy who is a tank driver. And it's basically the hero myth. If you're familiar with the Joseph Campbell concept of a hero myth. So it's not a documentary. It's not a real movie. It's not supposed to be realistic in that sense. But it's a fascinating concept. It's called White Tiger. Find it. And it gets based on a best-selling novel out of Russia. And the story, to me, was fascinating. Now, I had a guy send me this lengthy email explaining all the mistakes in the movie. And I said, you do understand it wasn't a documentary, right? And he's like, yeah. And I go... Those aren't mistakes. They did that for a purpose because they're trying to point something out. And he goes, but it wouldn't have happened that way. And I go, yeah, that's how a lot of stories are. There's a lot of stories that wouldn't have happened that way. And so it's, it's not a realistic movie in that sense. It's not supernatural science fiction. It's just got a little bit of a twist to it that to me made it very interesting. And it was one of those things where somebody came up with, I'm guessing the guy who wrote the novel, wrote the novel and came up with this idea and basically said, what if this had happened in the war? What, what would that have been like? And it's just an interesting little exercise. And I've had a lot of people tell me they watched the movie and they enjoyed it, except for the one guy who said, well, it's filled with mistakes and I should know I'm a teacher. <laughs> it's okay. He's the kind of guy who's grading stuff. Like he's, he's, he's proofreading the menu at a restaurant. Adam Montgomery. I watched the movie after you recommended it. I really liked it too. Jay Klein, read In the Land of White Death. Great book. I've not heard of that one. I'll check it out. Dreaming of Wheels. It's a movie, not a documentary. Exactly. Ed G., what's your opinion on the road workers being left on the bridge when the police already shut down traffic? I do not know enough about that. And in case you're curious... There's a boat coming that's got some kind of problem. The time frames in this, I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff, so we don't need to go into that. But somebody realized it's going to hit the bridge. They got the word out to law enforcement and said a boat is about to hit the bridge, shut traffic down on the bridge. They managed to shut the traffic down, the boat hit the bridge, and there were people working on the bridge. So did they not notify them? I don't know. Could they have notified them? I don't know. If they had been notified, but were like, say, on foot, nowhere near the truck, could they have gotten off? And again, I don't know. I don't know. So those are all questions we'll have to ask, but they did do a decent job of getting the traffic shut off. And if, can you imagine what would have happened if, like, say, that it happened during rush hour? You know, think about the, the, the San Francisco earthquake, you know, and what happened with all the people on that bridge. So it's it's tragic that those people passed away. It's a catastrophe what happened to the bridge and how long that's going to take to fix. 
And then, of course, the ripple effect that's going to happen with all the stuff that used to come in through that port that can't anymore. So it's going to be a whole bunch of stuff coming up. And I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't know. I don't know. But it'll be interesting to watch. That's an interesting question. Thank you for asking. Um, Larry58 McCaffrey, being a DJ from Michigan, you would have been exposed to a lot of Canadian music. Do you have any favorite artists? Uh, yes, I like a lot of Canadian music, but but I'll be honest with you. Um, I recently discovered a band called Strange Advance from Toronto, and they've got a song called Worlds Away. And it came out like 20 years ago. And I just found out about it now, 30 years ago. It's an old song. And the Canadian robot lady and I were discussing music one day. And I said, you must know about some good Canadian bands I don't know about. I mean, I know about Gordon Lightfoot, right? Obviously. Um, and so she goes, well, how about this? And she rattled off a bunch that I knew. And then one day she said, um, how about Strange Advance? I go, what? <laughs> Who is that? She goes, it's a band from Toronto. Never heard of them. So I looked it up. That's a song I absolutely love. Um, I like Gowan. Same time frame. Uh, he's a solo artist who occasionally now also fills in as the lead singer of Styx when they tour. But um, those are two that pop in my head right now. So... Armin Klugian says the object everyone is confused about looks like a poster or a picture in a frame on the floor near the corner of the room. Are we talking about that right there? Because this thing right here that's blocked by the chair is a framed poster of Robbie Robertson. This thing right here is a framed picture of Milo and Wolfie, my two dogs. This right here is a bookshelf. This whole thing is a bookshelf. And those are two cars right there. There is a radio tube right there. And then this stuff up here is not radio stuff. This is simply a bookshelf. And behind that picture, which you can't see through anyway, is likewise a, another bookshelf. It's a small bookshelf. So sorry. <laughs> There is no guitar amplifier back there. Um, and yes, there's a tube back there, which could look like it. So, and Colorado Drive says, do you think you'll ever get another dog? I don't think so. So, uh, no. I'm going to wrap it up right there. We've been talking now for two hours. Two hours. And I know that some of you got more important stuff to do. <laughs> I'm not saying I do. But I am going to sign off for now. I will try to do this again next week on Friday. We'll see. But follow the community tab on my YouTube page. I post it there. And when I know for a fact when and what time I'll be doing this, I'll post it there. For the people I didn't get to, I apologize. I try to glance at the, at the questions and try to answer them as best I can. But while I'm answering it, more pop by. Hey, Tom Spademan just checked in. Hey, Tom. Tom just checked in and says, I'm sure that I can see a Fender Princeton. <laughs> Tom's a good friend of mine. He plays the guitar as well. He's got guitars. He's got amplifiers. I will talk to you guys next week, but please don't forget Sunday at noon on my main channel, the 10th anniversary video extravaganza. I guarantee you, you'll like it. Not an actual guarantee, but you know what I'm saying? I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.